Chapter 7, Part B of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 7, Part B of Colonies. Part 2. Causes of the Prosperity of New Colonies. The colony of a civilized nation which takes possession either of a waste country, or of one so thinly inhabited that the natives easily give place to the new settlers, advances more rapidly to wealth and greatness than any other human society. The colonies carry out with them a knowledge of agriculture and of other useful arts, superior to what can grow up of its own accord, in the course of many centuries, among savage and barbarous nations. They carry out with them, too, the habit of subordination, some notion of the regular government which takes place in their own country, of the system of laws which support it, and of a regular administration of justice, and they naturally establish something of the same kind in the new settlement. But among savage and barbarous nations, the natural progress of law and government is still slower than the natural progress of arts, after law and government have been so far established as is necessary for their protection. Every colonist gets more land than he can possibly cultivate. He has no rent, and scarce any taxes, to pay. No landlord shares with him in its produce, and the share of the sovereign is commonly but a trifle. He has every motive to render as great as possible a produce which is thus to be almost entirely his own. But his land is commonly so extensive that, with all his own industry and with all the industry of other people whom he can get to employ, he can seldom make it produce the tenth part of what it is capable of producing. He is eager, therefore, to collect laborers from all quarters, and to reward them with the most liberal wages. But those liberal wages, joined to the plenty and cheapness of land, soon make those laborers leave him, in order to become landlords themselves, and to reward with equal liberality other laborers, who soon leave them for the same reason that they left their first master. The liberal reward of labor encourages marriage. The children, during the tender years of infancy, are well fed and properly taken care of, and when they are grown up, the value of their labor greatly overpays their maintenance. When arrived at maturity, the high price of labor and the low price of land enable them to establish themselves in the same manner as their fathers did before them. In other countries, rent and profit eat up wages, and the two superior orders of people oppress the inferior one. But in new colonies, the interest of the two superior orders obliges them to treat the inferior one with more generosity and humanity, at least where that inferior one is not in a state of slavery. Wastelands, of the greatest natural fertility, are to be had for a trifle. The increase of revenue which the proprietor, who is always the undertaker, expects from their improvement, constitutes his profit, which, in these circumstances, is commonly very great. But this great profit cannot be made without employing the labor of other people in clearing and cultivating the land, and the disproportion between the great extent of the land and the small number of the people, which commonly takes place in new colonies, makes it difficult for him to get this labor. He does not, therefore, dispute about wages, but is willing to employ labor at any price. The high wages of labor encourage population. The cheapness and plenty of good land encourage improvement, and enable the proprietor to pay those high wages. In those wages consists almost the whole price of the land, and though they are high, considered as the wages of labor, they are low, considered as the price of what is so very valuable. What encourages the progress of population and improvement, encourages that of real wealth and greatness. The progress of many of the ancient Greek colonies towards wealth and greatness seems accordingly to have been very rapid. In the course of a century or two, several of them appear to have rivaled and even to have surpassed their mother cities. Syracuse and Agrigentum in Sicily, Tarentum and Locri in Italy, Ephesus and Miletus in Lesser Asia appear by all accounts to have been at least equal to any of the cities of ancient Greece. Though posterior in their establishment, yet all the arts of refinement, philosophy, poetry, and eloquence seem to have been cultivated as early, and to have been improved as highly in them as in any part of the mother country. 
the schools of the two oldest Greek philosophers, those of Thales and Pythagoras, were established, it is remarkable, not in ancient Greece, but the one in an Asiatic, the other in an Italian colony. All those colonies had established themselves in countries inhabited by savage and barbarous nations, who easily gave place to the new settlers. They had plenty of good land, and as they were altogether independent of the mother city, they were at liberty to manage their own affairs in the way that they judged was most suitable to their own interests. The history of the Roman colonies is by no means so brilliant. Some of them, indeed, such as Florence, have, in the course of many ages, and after the fall of the mother city, grown up to be considerable states. But the progress of no one of them seems ever to have been very rapid. They were all established in conquered provinces, which in most cases had been fully inhabited before. The quantity of land assigned to each colonist was seldom very considerable, and, as the colony was not independent, they were not always at liberty to manage their own affairs in the way that they judged was most suitable to their own interest. In the plenty of good land, the European colonies established in America and the West Indies resemble, and even greatly surpass, those of ancient Greece. In their dependency upon the mother state, they resemble those of ancient Rome. But their great distance from Europe has in all of them alleviated more or less the effects of this dependency. Their situation has placed them less in the view and less in the power of their mother country. In pursuing their interest their own way, their conduct has upon many occasions been overlooked, either because not known or not understood in Europe and upon some occasions it has been fairly suffered and submitted to, because their distance rendered it difficult to restrain it. Even the violent and arbitrary government of Spain has, upon many occasions, been obliged to recall or soften the orders which had been given for the government of her colonies, for fear of a general insurrection. The progress of all the European colonies in wealth, population, and improvement has accordingly been very great. The crown of Spain, by its share of the gold and silver, derived some revenue from its colonies from the moment of their first establishment. It was a revenue, too, of a nature to excite in human avidity the most extravagant expectation of still greater riches. The Spanish colonies, therefore, from the moment of their first establishment, attracted very much the attention of their mother country, while those of the other European nations were for a long time in a great measure neglected. The former did not, perhaps, thrive the better in consequence of this attention, nor the latter the worse in consequence of this neglect. In proportion to the extent of the country which they in some measure possess, the Spanish colonies are considered as less populous and thriving than those of almost any other European nation. The progress even of the Spanish colonies, however, in population and improvement, has certainly been very rapid and very great. The city of Lima, founded since the conquest, is represented by Ulloa as containing 50,000 inhabitants near 30 years ago. Quito, which had been but a miserable hamlet of Indians, is represented by the same author as in his time equally populous. Gemelli Carreri, a pretended traveller, it is said, indeed, but who seems everywhere to have written upon extreme good information, represents the city of Mexico as containing a 100,000 inhabitants a number which, in spite of all the exaggerations of the Spanish writers, is probably more than five times greater than what it contained in the time of Montezuma. These numbers exceed greatly those of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, the three greatest cities of the English colonies. Before the conquest of the Spaniards there were no cattle fit for drought, either in Mexico or Peru. The llama was their only beast of burden, and its strength seems to have been a good deal inferior to that of a common ass. The plough was unknown among them. They were ignorant of the use of iron. They had no coined money, nor any established instrument of commerce of any kind. Their commerce was carried on by barter. A sort of wooden spade was their principal instrument of agriculture. Sharp stones served them for knives and hatchets to cut with. Fish bones and the hard sinews of certain animals, served them with needles to sew with, and these seem to have been their principal instruments of trade. In this state of things, it seems impossible that either of those empires could have been so much improved or so well cultivated as at present, when they are plentifully furnished with all sorts of European cattle, and when the use of iron, of the plough, and of many of the arts of Europe have been introduced among them. 
but the populousness of every country must be in proportion to the degree of its improvement and cultivation in spite of the cruel destruction of the natives which followed the conquest these two great empires are probably more populous now than they ever were before and the people are surely very different for we must acknowledge i apprehend that the spanish creoles are in many respects superior to the ancient indians after the settlements of the spaniards that of the portuguese in brazil is the oldest of any european nation in america but as for a long time after the first discovery neither gold nor silver mines were found in it and as it afforded upon that account little or no revenue to the crown it was for a long time in a great measure neglected and during this state of neglect it grew up to be a great and powerful colony while portugal was under the dominion of spain brazil was attacked by the dutch who got possession of seven of the fourteen provinces into which it is divided they expected soon to conquer the other seven when portugal recovered its independency by the elevation of the family of braganza to the throne the dutch then as enemies to the spaniards became friends to the portuguese who were likewise the enemies of the spaniards they agreed therefore to leave that part of brazil which they had not conquered to the king of portugal who agreed to leave that part which they had conquered to them as a matter not worth disputing about with such good allies but the dutch government soon began to oppress the portuguese colonists who instead of amusing themselves with complaints took arms against their new masters and by their own valour and resolution with the connivance indeed but without any avowed assistance from the mother country drove them out of brazil the dutch therefore finding it impossible to keep any part of the country to themselves were contended that it should be entirely restored to the crown of portugal in this colony there are said to be more than six hundred thousand people either portuguese or descended from portuguese creoles mulattoes and a mixed race between portuguese and brazilians no one colony in america is supposed to contain so great a number of people of european extraction towards the end of the fifteenth and during the greater part of the sixteenth century spain and portugal were the two great naval powers upon the ocean for though the commerce of venice extended to every part of europe its fleet had scarce ever sailed beyond the mediterranean the spaniards in virtue of the first discovery claimed all america as their own and though they could not hinder so great a naval power as that of portugal from settling in brazil such was at that time the terror of their name that the greater part of the other nations of europe were afraid to establish themselves in any other part of that great continent the french who attempted to settle in florida were all murdered by the spaniards but the declension of the naval power of this latter nation in consequence of the defeat or miscarriage of what they called their invincible armada which happened towards the end of the sixteenth century put it out of their power to obstruct any longer the settlements of the other european nations in the course of the seventeenth century therefore the english french dutch danes and swedes all the great nations who had any ports upon the ocean attempted to make some settlements in the new world the swedes established themselves in new jersey and the number of swedish families still to be found there sufficiently demonstrates that this colony was very likely to prosper had it been protected by the mother country but being neglected by sweden it was soon swallowed up by the dutch colony of new york which again in sixteen seventy four fell under the dominion of the english the small islands of st thomas and santa cruz are the only countries in the new world that have ever been possessed by the danes these little settlements too were under the government of an exclusive company which had the sole right both of purchasing the surplus produce of the colonies and of supplying them with such goods of other countries as they wanted and which therefore both in its purchases and sales had not only the power of oppressing them but the greatest temptation to do so the government of an exclusive company of merchants is perhaps the worst of all governments for any country whatever it was not however able to stop altogether the progress of these colonies though it rendered it more slow and languid the late king of denmark dissolved this company and since that time the prosperity of these colonies has been very great the dutch settlements in the west as well as those in the east indies were originally put under the government of an exclusive company 
the progress of some of them therefore though it has been considerable in comparison with that of almost any country that has been long peopled and established has been languid and slow in comparison with that of the greater part of new colonies the colony of surinam though very considerable is still inferior to the greater part of the sugar colonies of the other european nations the colony of nova belgia now divided into the two provinces of new york and new jersey would probably have soon become considerable too even though it had remained under the government of the dutch the plenty and cheapness of good land are such powerful causes of prosperity that the very worst government is scarce capable of checking altogether the efficacy of their operation the great distance too from the mother country would enable the colonists to evade more or less by smuggling the monopoly which the company enjoyed against them at present the company allows all dutch ships to trade to surinam upon paying two and a half per cent upon the value of their cargo for a license and only reserves to itself exclusively the direct trade from africa to america which consists almost entirely in the slave trade this relaxation in the exclusive privileges of the company is probably the principal cause of that degree of prosperity which that colony at present enjoys curacao and eustatia the two principal islands belonging to the dutch are free ports open to the ships of all nations and this freedom in the midst of better colonies whose ports are open to those of one nation only has been the great cause of the prosperity of those two barren islands the french colony of canada was during the greater part of the last century and some part of the present under the government of an exclusive company under so unfavorable an administration its progress was necessarily very slow in comparison with that of other new colonies but it became much more rapid when this company was dissolved after the fall of what is called the mississippi scheme when the english got possession of this country they found in it near double the number of inhabitants which father charlevoix had assigned to it between twenty and thirty years before that jesuit had travelled over the whole country and had no inclination to represent it as less considerable than it really was the french colony of st domingo was established by pirates and freebooters who for a long time neither required the protection nor acknowledged the authority of france and when that race of banditti became so far citizens as to acknowledge this authority it was for a long time necessary to exercise it with very great gentleness during this period the population and improvement of this colony increased very fast even the oppression of the exclusive company to which it was for some time subjected with all the other colonies of france though it no doubt retarded had not been able to stop its progress altogether the course of its prosperity returned as soon as it was relieved from that oppression it is now the most important of the sugar colonies of the west indies and its produce is said to be greater than that of all the english sugar colonies put together the other sugar colonies of france are in general all very thriving but there are no colonies of which the progress has been more rapid than that of the english in north america plenty of good land and liberty to manage their own affairs their own way seem to be the two great causes of the prosperity of all new colonies in the plenty of good land the english colonies of north america though no doubt very abundantly provided are however inferior to those of the spaniards and portuguese and not superior to some of those possessed by the french before the late war but the political institutions of the english colonies have been more favorable to the improvement and cultivation of this land than those of the other three nations first the engrossing of uncultivated land though it has by no means been prevented altogether has been more restrained in the english colonies than in any other the colony law which imposes upon every proprietor the obligation of improving and cultivating within a limited time a certain proportion of his lands and which in case of failure declares those neglected lands grantable to any other person though it has not perhaps been very strictly executed has however had some effect secondly in pennsylvania there is no right of primogeniture and lands like movables are divided equally among all the children of the family in three of the provinces of new england the oldest has only a double share as in the mosaical law 
though in those provinces therefore too great a quantity of land should sometimes be engrossed by a particular individual it is likely in the course of a generation or two to be sufficiently divided again in the other english colonies indeed the right of primogeniture takes place as in the law of england but in all the English colonies, the tenure of the lands, which are all held by free sockage, facilitates alienation, and the grantee of an extensive tract of land generally finds it for his interest to alienate, as fast as he can, the greater part of it, reserving only a small quit-rent. In the Spanish and Portuguese colonies, what is called the right of majorazo takes place in the succession of all those great estates to which any title of honor is annexed such estates go all to one person and are in effect entailed and unalienable the french colonies indeed are subject to the custom of paris which in the inheritance of land is much more favourable to the younger children than the law of england but in the french colonies if any part of an estate held by the noble tenure of chivalry and homage is alienated it is for a limited time subject to the right of redemption either by the heir of the superior or by the heir of the family and all the largest estates of the country are held by such noble tenures which necessarily embarrass alienation but in a new colony a great uncultivated estate is likely to be much more speedily divided by alienation than by succession the plenty and cheapness of good land it has already been observed are the principal causes of the rapid prosperity of new colonies the engrossing of land, in effect, destroys this plenty and cheapness. The engrossing of uncultivated land, besides, is the greatest obstruction to its improvement. But the labor that is employed in the improvement and cultivation of land affords the greatest and most valuable produce to the society. The produce of labor, in this case, pays not only its own wages and the profit of the stock which employs it, but the rent of the land, too, upon which it is employed the labour of the english colonies therefore being more employed in the improvement and cultivation of land is likely to afford a greater and more valuable produce than that of any of the other three nations which by the engrossing of land is more or less diverted towards other employments thirdly the labour of the english colonists is not only likely to afford a greater and more valuable produce but in consequence of the moderation of their taxes a greater proportion of this produce belongs to themselves which they may store up and employ in putting into motion a still greater quantity of labour the english colonists have never yet contributed anything towards the defence of the mother country or towards the support of its civil government they themselves on the contrary have hitherto been defended almost entirely at the expense of the mother country but the expense of fleets and armies is out of all proportion greater than the necessary expense of civil government the expense of their own civil government has always been very moderate it has generally been confined to what was necessary for paying competent salaries to the governor to the judges and to some other officers of police and for maintaining a few of the most useful public works the expense of the civil establishment of massachusetts bay before the commencement of the present disturbances used to be but about eighteen thousand pound a year that of new hampshire and rhode island three thousand five hundred pound each that of connecticut four thousand pound that of new york and pennsylvania four thousand five hundred pound each that of new jersey one thousand two hundred pounds that of virginia and south carolina eight thousand pounds each the civil establishments of nova scotia and georgia are partly supported by an annual grant of parliament but nova scotia pays besides about seven thousand pounds a year towards the public expenses of the colony and georgia about two thousand five hundred pounds a year all the different civil establishments in north america in short exclusive of those of maryland and north carolina of which no exact account has been got did not before the commencement of the present disturbances cost the inhabitants about sixty four thousand seven hundred pounds a year an ever memorable example at how small an expense three millions of people may not only be governed but well governed the most important part of the expense of government indeed that of defence and protection has constantly fallen upon the mother country the ceremonial too of the civil government in the colonies upon the reception of a new governor upon the opening of a new assembly etc though sufficiently decent is not accompanied with any expensive pomp or parade 
their ecclesiastical government is conducted upon a plan equally frugal tithes are unknown among them and their clergy who are far from being numerous are maintained either by moderate stipends or by the voluntary contributions of the people the power of spain and portugal on the contrary derives some support from the taxes levied upon their colonies france indeed has never drawn any considerable revenue from its colonies the taxes which it levies upon them being generally spent among them but the colony government of all these three nations is conducted upon a much more extensive plan and is accompanied with a much more expensive ceremonial the sums spent upon the reception of a new viceroy of peru for example have frequently been enormous such ceremonials are not only real taxes paid by the rich colonists upon those particular occasions but they serve to introduce among them the habit of vanity and expense upon all other occasions they are not only very grievous occasional taxes but they contribute to establish perpetual taxes of the same kind still more grievous the ruinous taxes of private luxury and extravagance in the colonies of all those three nations too the ecclesiastical government is extremely oppressive tithes take place in all of them and are levied with the utmost rigor in those of spain and portugal all of them besides are oppressed with a numerous race of mendicant friars whose beggary being not only licensed but consecrated by religion is a most grievous tax upon the poor people who are most carefully taught that it is a duty to give and a very great sin to refuse them their charity over and above all this the clergy are in all of them the greatest engrossers of land fourthly in the disposal of their surplus produce or of what is over and above their own consumption the english colonies have been more favored and have been allowed a more extensive market than those of any other european nation every european nation has endeavored more or less to monopolize to itself the commerce of its colonies and upon that account has prohibited the ships of foreign nations from trading to them and has prohibited them from importing european goods from any foreign nation but the manner in which this monopoly has been exercised in different nations has been very different some nations have given up the whole commerce of their colonies to an exclusive company of whom the colonists were obliged to buy all such european goods as they wanted and to whom they were obliged to sell the whole of their surplus produce it was the interest of the company therefore not only to sell the former as dear and to buy the latter as cheap as possible but to buy no more of the latter even at this low price than what they could dispose of for a very high price in europe it was their interest not only to degrade in all cases the value of the surplus produce of the colony but in many cases to discourage and keep down the natural increase of its quantity of all the expedients that can well be contrived to stunt the natural growth of a new colony that of an exclusive company is undoubtedly the most effectual this however has been the policy of holland though their company in the course of the present century has given up in many respects the exertion of their exclusive privilege this too was the policy of denmark till the reign of the late king it has occasionally been the policy of france and of late since seventeen fifty five after it had been abandoned by all other nations on account of its absurdity it has become the policy of portugal with regard at least to two of the principal provinces of brazil pernambuco and marinon other nations without establishing an exclusive company have confined the whole commerce of their colonies to a particular port of the mother country from whence no ship was allowed to sail but either in a fleet and at a particular season or if single in consequence of a particular license which in most cases was very well paid for this policy opened indeed the trade of the colonies to all the natives of the mother country provided they traded from the proper port at the proper season and in the proper vessels but as all the different merchants who joined their stocks in order to fit out those licensed vessels would find it for their interest to act in concert the trade which was carried on in this manner would necessarily be conducted very nearly upon the same principles as that of an exclusive company the profit of those merchants would be almost equally exorbitant and oppressive the colonies would be ill supplied and would be obliged both to buy very dear and to sell very cheap 
This, however, till within these few years, had always been the policy of Spain, and the price of all European goods, accordingly, is said to have been enormous in the Spanish West Indies. At Quito, we are told by Ulloa, a pound of iron sold for about four shillings sixpence, and a pound of steel for about six shillings ninepence sterling. But it is chiefly in order to purchase European goods that the colonies part with their own produce. The more, therefore, they pay for the one, the less they really get for the other, and the dearness of the one is the same thing with the cheapness of the other. The policy of Portugal is, in this respect, the same as the ancient policy of Spain, with regard to all its colonies, except Pernambuco and Maranon, and with regard to these it has lately adopted a still worse. Other nations leave the trade of their colonies free to all their subjects, who may carry it on from all the different ports of the mother country, and who have occasion for no other license than the common dispatches of the custom house. In this case, the number and dispersed situation of the different traders renders it impossible for them to enter into any general combination, and their competition is sufficient to hinder them from making very exorbitant profits. Under so liberal a policy, the colonies are enabled both to sell their own produce and to buy the goods of Europe at a reasonable price. But since the dissolution of the Plymouth Company, when our colonies were but in their infancy, this has always been the policy of England. It has generally, too, been that of France, and has been uniformly so since the dissolution of what in England is commonly called their Mississippi Company. The profits of the trade, therefore, which France and England carry on with their colonies, though no doubt somewhat higher than if the competition were free to all other nations, are, however, by no means exorbitant, and the price of European goods, accordingly, is not extravagantly high in the greater part of the colonies of either of those nations. In the exportation of their own surplus produce, too, it is only with regard to certain commodities that the colonies of Great Britain are confined to the market of the mother country. These commodities, having been enumerated in the Act of Navigation, and in some other subsequent acts, have upon that account been called enumerated commodities. The rest are all called non-enumerated, and may be exported directly to other countries, provided it is in British or plantation ships, of which the owners and three-fourths of the mariners are British subjects. End of Book 4, Chapter 7, Part B